Hola, welcome to Musical Hacks. This week, we're going to build a circuit. We're going to look at how step sequences work and what this set of massive wires is actually doing. In a future episode, we're going to replace some of these wires with microcontrollers so that we can build an even more flexible step sequencer. If you would like to hear about that episode, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell. Last week, we looked at a variety of platforms that we can use to build our own instruments. This week, we're going to get a bit lower level. We're going to look at some of the basic electronics that we require to actually interface with those microcontrollers. From there, we will go on and actually extend this with the microcontrollers into something much more flexible. To help you follow along with this series, I've created a wiki, which we'll find a link to in the description below. That wiki will contain all sorts of additional material and links connected with these episodes and also where applicable source code. So first thing we're going to need for this project is a breadboard. A breadboard allows us to connect various components without having to solder them. Now, the way these work, if you've not come across them before, is that each of these columns is connected. What we usually then do is use the top and the bottom rows down here for power. So we will put in the voltage onto the plus side and ground onto the negative side here. This raises the question, how will we power the circuit? For this particular example, we could just use something simple like this, which is just a clip to a nine volt battery. However, when we start dealing with microcontroller units, we're going to need to be able to regulate the voltage to things like 3.3 and five volts. So we might want to start using something like this, which is specifically designed for a breadboard. It simply clips on here. Now what's interesting to note here is it can be powered via the DC power supply or via USB. And also you'll notice here that we can actually regulate it for either five volts or 3.3 volts, which can be important for the particular microcontrollers you're using. Another alternative, and one that you'll see me using, is this is actually just basically some uh, breadboards, but with some extra electronics which do the powering and also give you some nice things. This is by Peter Edwards of Casper Electronics and you can get from Bastor. Similarly also they'd sell some convenient things like potentiometers that fit onto the board. The other possibility when we get into microcontrollers is that we can actually mount a microcontroller on here and these also have a USB power. So what you can actually do is to take this and to take the power off of the microcontroller to use for your rest of your components. This we won't do today as we're dealing with a standalone electronics. What else are we going to need? Well, we're gonna need a few cables to connect things up. These are breadboard cables. Um, you can get them in all sorts of different forms. They cost very little for an entire box of them. The other thing I would recommend is a multimeter. These come in all sorts of shapes and budgets. There's actually only three things that I use on it. A continuity checker. This allows us to check that things are connected where we expect them to be. A voltmeter to measure the voltage in various parts of a circuit. And a resistance meter. This checks to see what resistance is available. The final one I actually use quite a lot because I'm not very good at reading resistor values and I actually find it easier to use a multimeter to just tell me what the resistor values are. The reason I recommend this is that when you find your circuit doesn't work, you're gonna need some way of, of debugging it and this is the way to do it. The other thing is when you're using microcontrollers, it's a good idea to check that voltages going into the microcontroller. It's quite easy to damage them 
if you get the circuit wrong. Okay, so now we have power, we have a breadboard, we have some cables. Let's start building. This step sequencer is basically going to be a sequence of voltages that we're going to run through. So the first thing we need to do is to actually have a way of dialing in the voltages. And to do that, we're going to use a potentiometer. Now, potentiometers come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Uh, they've come in linear, exponential, etc. And you've basically got two types. You've got the larger panel mount type, like this, and then the smaller type. Either will work for this. Let's see how we're going to generate these different voltages. So let's look at how our circuit's going to work. So the first thing we need is a bunch of potentiometers which are going to produce different voltages. And then the idea is that we're going to sequence those voltages. So how does a potentiometer generate different voltages? Well, this is based on a principle called voltage dividers. So if we imagine two resistors in series connected to five volts, and we take a connection in the middle, so we divide it, the question is, what is this voltage? And it turns out that the voltage is relative to the resistance of this resistor and the second resistor. So if this resistor was 4 volt, 40k, and this resistor was 1k, this voltage is 1 over 4 plus 1. So equals 1 volt. A variable resistor works just like this. If we look at the three terminals, one represents this side, one represents this side, we connect to five volts on one side and on this side, and then we take a voltage here. And the variable resistor actually has a strip in it. And that's actually when you turn the potentiometer, you're basically moving this point here along that strip. Okay, so let's look at this in practice. So what I've done here is I've connected up a potentiometer and you can see that on one side, on this yellow wire, I've taken it to ground and on the other side, I've taken it to a five volt source. And here this green wire, I'm taking out the voltage that's going then into the multimeter. If I turn the potentiometer, it goes from five volts to one end, down to zero volts at the other end. Now, another point that's interesting here is the way that the uh, multimeter is connected. So you'll see, as I say, I, the green wire here is connected to the red terminal, so the positive terminal, and it's important to connect the ground wire, the black wire here, to the ground on the board. Now, this is something that we'll see frequently. You always have to make sure that your components share a common ground. Okay, so now we have a way of getting a potentiometer to give different voltages. So for our step sequencer, we're going to need eight of these, which will give us each of the different steps. Now what we need is a way of taking each step and just outputting it. So we have one voltage going out. And what we're going to use for that is a multiplexer. or a MUX. The particular one we're going to use is called a 4051 multiplexer. And so it will take these eight voltages and it will put out one voltage. But we obviously have to select which one. So we've got a pin to select. But these multiplexers don't use one pin to select. They actually use digital logic for selection. So we've got eight outputs, so we're going to need three address lines because that would be in binary, that would be seven, so zero to seven. 
Now, the next part of the puzzle is how do we actually step through them? And for that, we use another IC called a counter or a ripple counter. We're going to use a 4040 counter. These work quite simply. They basically have an input signal here called clock, and they will just step through one at a time. And then they will output on their data lines here. So we pulse the clock and it advances through the counters. These pins are actually called, as you can see on the data sheet, Q1 to Qn. When we're going to use one, two, and three. Now, there's more pins here available on this counter. It goes up to 12. We actually don't want it to do that. We only want it to count to seven and then to reset. So what we actually need to do is to take Q4 here and connect it to the reset pin on the counter. And in that way, it will count from zero to seven and then it will reset and then go back to zero again. So the question is, how do we now drive this counter? Now, if we were doing this in a modular environment, we could just simply connect this to a trigger input and that would work. However, I want this circuit to be completely standalone. So I want to have its own internal clock. And to do that, we're going to use a simple oscillator. Okay, so how are we going to make this oscillator? Well, I'm going to use the simplest way I know, which is to use a 40106 IC. And this is actually a bunch of Schmidt triggers. Schmidt trigger is quite fun because what it is, is it's an inverter inside the chip. And if we connect it to a, a voltage source, what we do is we connect the output to the input with a resistor, and then from here down to ground. And there, here, we get a square wave. The reason this works is basically what we've got is we're inverting the input to the output, and it, but it's feeding back on itself. So when this goes to one, it basically tries to bring one on this side, and then it gets converted from one to zero, and then it's therefore it's a Keep continuous feedback circuit. The frequency of this oscillator is dependent upon the values of these resistor here and this capacitor. And we can actually get this to range from anything from simple LFO all the way up to audio rate signals. So we're going to use that simple oscillator to drive the counter and so step through the sequence. Now there's one Final part of this system. I want to have some LEDs. Okay, so I want to use these LEDs so that we can actually see what step the sequencer is on currently. So if we imagine our little LEDs down here, we're gonna have eight of those as well. So how do we connect these in? Well, it so happens that we use the same MUX. 4051. We need a different instance of it. And then we can actually use the same address lines here to actually drive this MUX as well. And we connect five volts to the input, and then we go to the LEDs to light the LEDs. Now, what's interesting about this is it shows that a MUX is bidirectional. So in our first example here, the potentiometers were generating the voltage and we're sending it to an output. But in this example, we're actually taking the voltage, the five volt voltage, out to the appropriate LED. Mux doesn't care, it's just a switch. Let's have a little look and see if we can see what I drew on the previous diagram. This is the oscillator, the 106. Here we have the counter that I mentioned, and the these two are the muxes, the multiplexes. Now, the top one here is actually responsible for the LEDs, and the second one down here is responsible for the potentiometers. These two potentiometers are nothing special. Uh, they just happen to be quite a compact size, which is useful for this board. We can see that we have 
five volts coming into here, and it's put onto the rails. Now, it all looks like a big mess, and that's something that is quite typical of these kind of patch boards, uh, because all the, there's so many long cables, etc. But I've tried to color code it so that you can actually see what's going on. So red, I've actually used for positive five volts. Um, the yellow, I've actually used for ground. Then we can actually go on and have a look at the blue, which are the signal cables. So I've used the same signal cables going to the LEDs, you see, to this MUX, and then this signal cable here goes to this MUX down here. Then what we can see is the white cables here. There are three of them. These are coming from the counter and going to each of the two MUXs. Now, there are a few things to be aware of. First of all is I'll show you the pinout diagrams. If you look at the pinout diagram on the counter, you can see that the pins aren't labeled just one, two, three, four so easily. So you have to make sure you get the right pins uh, when you come out of them. Similarly, the, on the multiplexer as well, they're actually labeled in a fairly random seemingly order, but you can make sure that you get them in one at a time. The second thing which I didn't show in the diagram is that you'll see that for each LED here, we actually also have a resistor. You should never run voltage directly through an LED, you'll probably blow it. And so what we do is basically we take the five volts that's coming through the multiplexer here through a, a resistor, which is 220K, 220 ohms rather, then we run it through the LED down into ground. Light emitting diodes are polarized. That means that they actually have one side that has to go to the positive and one side that has to go to ground. You can see that one of these legs is actually slightly shorter. That's this one. And this one has to go to ground and the other one goes to the supply side. Similarly, you'll find on capacitors that those may be all also polarized. So if we look here on this one, again, you see that it's the shorter leg that's ground or and it's also marked as negative. You see? Not all capacitors are polarized though. How do I get the thing to actually work? So what we've got going on here is you can see from the potentiometers, as I said, there's an output. This is actually coming onto the board here, which has uh, just a converter to a jack really, which I'm then using with a modular. Oscillator over here, very, very straightforward. Um, basically, I've just used, again, this is quite a nice board because it's got a set of potentiometers on it and it just allows me to slow down the oscillator and speed up the oscillator. You can see it goes to, to very fast rates. In fact, it will go to audio rate without any problems. So as I say, it looks like quite a complicated board, but actually in reality, it's very straightforward. Now let's have a look at some other interesting sides of this. So first of all, you'll notice that this cable here, this is actually connected to the reset of the clock. And basically what's happening is it's set to ground, so it basically never resets. That's no problem because we're just using the lower three bits of the counter anyway. But what's quite interesting is this is how we can actually control the length of the sequence. If I actually move this from the ground and I take it to a point here, we can now see that we've shortened the sequence. And that's because every time the sequence gets to this step, it sends a high to the reset and so resets the counter. So this is how we can quite easily change the set length. Now let's take a look at this with the A modular. Now, the first thing I will point out is that before you plug any of your circuits into another piece of external gear, always check the outputs with a multimeter. Uh, 
you don't want to suddenly put very high voltage through a system and break it. Okay, the second thing I'd like to point out is that the reason I've taken it through this cable here is actually, and put it into the control voltage is partly for protection, but it's also because I need to actually share a ground signal between this circuit and the AE modular. Now, reality is I could actually remove this power here and the ground and actually take power and ground from the AE modular. And obviously if we were developing a module, that is what we would do. But to keep them independent, I wanted to separate them initially. I like using AE modular for a couple of reasons, but really this is a, a small system here and I can, you can see I can actually run it directly off a, a USB battery pack, which makes it useful. It's also unipolar voltage. So this actually runs from zero to five volts. So it's ideal for connecting with these kind of circuits and microcontrollers, which are also using either zero to five volts or zero to 3.3 volts. And obviously, as well. The modules and things are a lot cheaper. So if you do somehow manage to damage something, it's not going to be a mighty investment like it would be with Eurorack. The other side of this, which is interesting, is that of course we can share signals. So we have an oscillator here that's actually being used to drive the step sequence, but we could use AE modular to do it instead. So if I disconnect the LFO here, we can see this is the wire that's actually coming from the oscillator and going to the counter. I can remove this. You can see the thing has stopped. And now if I actually plug this into the LFO, we can actually see that it can run. Of course, <laughs> being modular, of course, you can run this at anything. I mean, you can run this quite happily at ridiculous audio rates as well. So this step sequence at audio rates actually becomes a wave shaper because obviously what we're doing is we're changing the way that the wave goes up and down by the voltages that we're sending. Conversely, of course, we could also take this oscillator and actually run that into a modular as well. So that's, that's a step sequencer. Now the key takeaways that I wanted to show, because we're going to take this further on, is first of all, the way that the potentiometers are used as voltage dividers, the way we've used a multiplexer here as a kind of a switch, uh, and we use that bidirectionally, either to get the voltages from the potentiometers or to drive your LEDs. We can also see here how a step sequencer works. It basically switches through a set of voltages using a counter. And then you need some kind of trigger to basically move the steps forward. So in the next episode, what we're going to do is we're going to start taking bits of this circuit away and replacing it by a microcontroller. I hope this was interesting. If you have any comments about the circuit, then please place them in the comments below. If you have ideas for future episodes that you would like also, place a comment in below and subscribe and click on the notification bell. So for our next episode, you'll get notified when we go into connecting this up to microcontrollers and start looking at how we can drive this by software to get different functionality from a step sequencer.